Welcome to the 54th InterScience Conference on Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy, or ICAC. And this is ASM Live. I'm Michael Schmidt from This Week in Microbiology, and together with the program committee, we have selected some of the science that's being presented here this week, and we're bringing it to you live here this morning so that we may be able to discuss the cool science that the authors are being are presenting. I encourage your participation and ask that you only present yourself to the microphone or post your questions via Twitter or the live chat. Today we have with us um, Nishant Prasad from the New York Hospital in Queens, New York, and Frederick Resman from Lund University. This morning we're going to talk about antibiotic stewardship, saving lives, saving drugs, and saving money. Antibiotic stewardship programs, which promote the appropriate use of antibiotics in hospitals and other healthcare centers, can not only lead to reduction in antibiotic use with no adverse effects, but can also lead to significant savings. Today, our guests are going to discuss this brave new world of antibiotic stewardship. So, gentlemen, welcome to ASM Live. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm going to give you a low ball question first. What is antibiotic stewardship? You want to take this? Um, sure. Well, to me, antibiotic stewardship is really about the rational <laughs> use of antibiotics uh, and uh, to have a controlled rational use of antibiotics, really. Uh, so let, let's expand on that. Nishant, why don't you explain what rational use means? Right. So antibiotics in and of themselves are fairly complicated when you get down to the nitty-gritty of what's going on and actually making sure that they're used appropriately used for the right patients at the right time in the right doses is not something that every physician can manage on all of their patients with all the myriad of things that's going on so stewardship is one of those programs that we implement to ensure that antibiotics are used judiciously it's sort of like controlled burning when we think about forest management. When do you set the forest on fire? And that's a, the equivalent of, of using an antibiotic is you're going to do a controlled burn. Is that a good analogy? That is a very good analogy, yes. Sure, sure. So let me ask you the next question that my dear colleagues ask me all the time when I talk about antibiotic stewardship. Is this more trouble than it's worth? So. Trouble is, is the, the question is, is what is it causing trouble to, or who is it causing trouble to? Uh, the goal of every stewardship program is to, to essentially improve patients' health care, make sure that they're getting the right drugs and without having so many adverse events um, and using less of them because using them too much is, is a double-edged sword. Um, so is it troublesome to the physicians? Well, yes, there's somebody looking over their shoulder telling them what to do with their antibiotics. Um, the vast majority of them are very, very thankful that we're helping them out yeah. uh, take care of their patients. I'm, I'm sure I you've mean, seen the same thing. That's my experience as well. Most, uh, most physicians are actually thankful for the stewardship programs and the help that they get with infected patients. I mean, so I would say no, it's not more trouble than it's worth. So why don't you guys tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about. You have two separate papers that you're presenting, so dealer's choice. Which one of you want to go All first? Right. So uh, our paper studied the, a number of different things with our stewardship program. Our stewardship program at our hospital at New York Hospital Queens in Flushing, New York, started initially in 2009 but was limited in scope. It didn't cover the entire hospital at that time. And in 2011, it grew to encompass the entirety of the hospital. So we started tracking the resistance of bacteria to antibiotics from 2011 onwards and how much we were spending on antibiotics, how much we were using antibiotics, and what kind of interventions the program was making uh, to help physicians care for their patients. And so that's really the gist of what our paper presents is, well, how did we do when we started this program? And it turns out we did really well. So what does the word intervention mean with respect to stewardship? What, what do you actually do? So uh, the, the, the interventions, so the stewardship program monitors the use of antibiotics in the hospital. And we have an electronic medical record, so we use that as, as a very 
basic way of looking at what's going on with every patient. Because you can't examine every patient in a 500 bed hospital. That's just mm -hmm. not possible. Um, so using the computer, we get an idea of what patients are on which antibiotics, which antibiotics are important for us to monitor. And then based on that, we make sure that the patient is getting the right dose and, or, or that they are on the right bug, uh, drug for the right bug that they've got, um, or they're not getting their antibiotic when no antibiotic is necessary. And that usually initiates a phone call to the physician, because they're not going to go find all of these physicians wherever they are, might be. That's, again, too cumbersome. So you make a phone call, have a discussion with the physician, make a recommendation, and that's an intervention. So did your intervention work? The, the bottom line. The bottom line is, is it, that's, that's, that's the gist of the poster, is that, that it seems to have worked quite well. Um, and in certain areas that were not expected. And um, no, it's, no, stewardship programs aren't new. They've you know, been documented and talked about for more than two decades. But um, this is the first time we did it at our hospital from 2009 onwards. And it seems like it's done excellently well. Do you think the fact that more and more hospitals in the United States are moving towards electronic medical records, that stewardship programs can become more effective? I think the computer is an excellent tool to help with that, but it's, you know, and like any tool, you have to know how to use it properly. So, what's going on in Europe? Well, I, I mean, Europe is a big, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a big, big continent. But I can just say that what we, what we were doing in, in Malmö, Sweden, is that we didn't really have a stewardship program until 2013. So we initiated one in 2013, and uh, what we did, practically, that we went to the, to the actual wards two times a week and we discussed with the physicians on each patient that, that was given antibiotics and we sat down and we had a talk and an audit on each patient. Just a couple of minutes audit and uh, uh, then we gave a recommendation, treatment recommendation on each patient. We did it twice a week for half a year and then we compared, sort of a case control compare with 2012, the same months, to see the outcome we had. So for those in the audience that that are listening or are here who don't yet have a stewardship program, and you stood one up, yeah. how hard was it to do? I mean, not so hard. People, That's good. People were very generous and thankful when you came to the ward and discussed everybody welcomed you, and uh, people were thankful, and uh, you sort of, the level of discussion on infections were just higher when we were there, I think. We discussed infections more, we discussed treatment alternatives, sort of a, an educational outreach at the same time. So you're converting your generalist uh, colleagues into infectious disease professionals. Well, not really, but we had it. I mean, we had a 24-hour service before. They could just call us up if they wanted to. They just didn't do that when they needed help. So we had to go to them, and uh, they, they needed some help. You're listening to ASM Live, and should you have any questions, please post them to the Twitterverse, or members of the audience, please feel free to use the microphone and ask your questions. Gentlemen, so where do you go next? So in our case, it's make sure that our program remains in place, because all of these programs require an investment of time and manpower, um, sometimes even resources, to make sure that they stay in, in effect. Uh, because you have to essentially show, I mean, there, there, there are bean counters at every institution. Oh, yes. And uh, you've got to make sure that you're, you're producing something that, that is tangible. Um, and that's something that we were also able to show. So uh, you were able to measure something. We and, were able to measure, And correct. you demonstrated that you saved X dollars. amount of dollars, yes. Actually, at our facility in 2013, um, an estimated over $600,000. Again, wow. that's an estimated savings because once you make the intervention, you can't go back in time to well, see what, what happened if you didn't make the intervention right. It's like using a coupon. You know you saved the money, but you don't actually get the money. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So have you, have you begun to look at cost savings in your system? We're not financial cost savings per, uh, per dollar or so, or, or per the Swedish crown, but we looked at, we had a 20% reduction in antibiotic treatment, and we had a reduction in IV treatment, and uh, so that's going to be money saved. We haven't looked at it yet, though, but there is money saved. And for us, continuation, we actually, I mean, this was a six-month project for us, but so we have uh, funding now from the hospital to continue. Well, that's great news. So let's ask the future question. So we know antibiotic stewardship programs are able to save money, but will they extend the utility or the life expectancy of 
the clinical use of the antibiotics we currently have in place. Because again, that's what we really want. We want to be able to continue to use the drugs that we have, because as you both know better than I, the microbes are getting really smart and they're resistant to almost everything we have in the, the pharmacy. Right. Um, so that was actually something that was unusual that we found when we were looking at our, at our performance of the program, is the rates of drug-resistant bacteria at our hospital decreased over the period that we had the stewardship program, which was not, so you not known. So you, you began to look at the resistome of, of the hospital. And That's this was the, the antibiotic resistance in patients, or was this the antibiotic resistance from things like uh, bed rails? No, oh, no, these are from patients. These are all clinical specimens, and we looked at the percentage of patients that had multi-drug resistant bacteria, resistant to multiple classes of, of, of drugs that are the most difficult to treat, and said, well, you know, how are they doing? And it turns out there was a, quite a nice association between the presence of the stewardship program and a decrease in, in the amount of resistance. So I think it should extend the life of our antibiotics if there's less resistance sure, going around. Sure, I agree, I agree. We actually had very low levels from start, so we didn't see any change in it, but we didn't see any increase, at least <laughs> during the yeah, and that's, and that's, short. that's really important, I mean, that you didn't see an increase. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have a question from the audience. Hi, Lynn Peterson from Trends in Medicine. So how has this program affected your use of newer antibiotics or more expensive antibiotics? And has that um, discouraged, in a sense, the use of newer ones? That uh, sounds like a question so, for both of you. Yeah, sure. so. um, in our case, newer antibiotics and more expensive antibiotics are on what's called our restricted list. So it's one where you have to get approval from the stewardship program before you can use them. I mean, you can get them initially, but they all require review periodically and usually within the first 48 to 72 hours by our, our pharmacist um, to make sure that the use is appropriate and warranted. Uh, because, you know, like you said, they're a precious resource and, uh, you know, using them willy-nilly is going to make sure that they are no longer useful within a very short period of time. So how about Well, we don't have a restriction list, uh, but wide-spectrum antibiotic antibiotics were actually uh, reduced during our program. Well, this sounds like this is really exciting news that we're finally getting a handle on, you know, the ethical and appropriate use of, of, of these precious resources. So what's next? It, you know, drug, the bacteria are, like you said, smarter than us. They're, they've been around for billions of years more than we have, and they're going to figure it out eventually. What we really do need are more antibiotics, to be honest with you. New classes, we haven't had a new class in, what, 20 years? Um, that's why we have the program 20 by 20. Right. You know, in the United States, and it's why they're, they're coming up with the Longitude Prize in the UK. We have another question from the audience, please. Hi, I'm Ken Lawrence um, with AstraZeneca. I mean, I think we've heard uh, over the years and, and decades about the impact of these programs reducing cost. But could either of you or both of you address uh, the potential benefits or the demonstrated benefits at your in institutions in terms of patient care? Because that, that's something that ultimately I think we're all interested yeah. in. Yeah. Um, the cost savings will eventually sure. dry up. Uh, but so for us, we had no change in outcome in mortality. We had a happier, we were actually targeted geriatric patients in our program. So we had a median age of 83 in our wow. program. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we had no change in mortality, but we had uh, reduced readmissions within 28 days. Reduced, reduced readmissions. Reduced readmissions within That's 28 the holy days. grail in the United States. Yeah. So, so in our case, um, one of the things that we notice is, I mean, we didn't look specifically at mortality at our hospital. That's probably next stages. Um, but Antibiotics are medications, and every medication has side effects. Well, if you don't know that a patient is having a side effect, then you can't do something about it until it's you know, well, well advanced. Um, and having somebody review every patient that's on antibiotics can check and see. And we actually had increased reporting of adverse events to antibiotics, which is something that's mandated by the, you know, in, in by the United the States FDA. by the FDA. Um, you have to make sure that every patient that gets an antibiotic isn't having an adverse reaction to it because you don't want to harm the patient while treating their infection. Um, so that certainly was one thing that, that would, was improved. And as I mentioned before, the decrease in resistance is, is an inter a very interesting phenomenon. Now, it's not the only intervention that was made at the hospital to try to decrease resistance, but certainly one of the multitude of other things that was done question from the Twitterverse. Yes, we have a question from the chat room referring back to earlier comments. Kirthen asks, 
As the gentleman said, using computers, we can control it. Any specific way to do that? Oh, that's a great question. So the computer is just allows for a centralized tracking mechanism in our case. We use it so that one person can sit at one terminal and look at the entirety of the hospital and all of the antibiotic use. We can generate lists to see who's on what antibiotics and whether or not those antibiotics are used appropriately. So it's, it's, it makes things convenient at a very large institution. We're 500 beds so that we can actually manage taking care of all of these antibiotics. It, it's, it, you know, the numbers your, are just become very large very quickly. So does your software produce like a heat map showing that in the intensive care unit the antibiotic use is in the red zone because 20 out of 20 patients are on antibiotics and you can then color it with the other drugs or it's is that not, a wish list? No, it's not that sophisticated yet. This is, this is still uh, requires us to, to know, make a list based on every specific antibiotic, look at all the patients that are on those antibiotics because really the point of stewardship is to look at every patient on antibiotics. Right. Sure. Because after all, medicine is individualized. It, it's not one size fits all. It, not every all. patient is unique. So how about in Sweden? Yeah. Well, it's not about, also, I'll just add that, it's not about also, always about reducing antibiotic use. It's also about improving antibiotic use in the individual patient, actually improving outcome in the patient. That's what you want when you go there as an ID specialist. I mean, the, the main outcome, I mean, the main thing you want is a better outcome for the patient, really. And if you can achieve less antibiotic use with that, that's perfect. Another question. Uh, Lynn Peterson again. So, if you don't have outcomes data, you could actually be making outcomes worse. That and is so isn't it critical to have that data? I mean, you might think intuitively that that wouldn't happen, but until you prove it, it could be dangerous. Absolutely correct. The, um, the outcomes data, again, is something we'll have to measure going forward. It's not something we have at this point. Uh, outcomes, you know, it's all, healthcare is it's outcomes driven, as yeah. we both know, all three of us know. And, and that's one of the things that we're looking towards electronics to help us evaluate. Another question from the audience, please. Hi, Dr. Silva from Cardiff, United Kingdom, one of the microbiology consultants. Uh, covering whole ward, whole hospital twice a week is a huge task. Have you tried different models? No, this is the first model that we've tried. I mean, it's, it's, it would sound like a huge task. It took, a, I mean, uh, we targeted four, four wards, total of 74 beds. So we didn't do the whole hospital. We targeted the, the wards for internal medicine and geriatrics and this because uh, we had a, a point prevalence studies show that we had 40 to 45 percent of the patients in these wards on antibiotics at any time. Uh, so we knew that there was a lot of antibiotic treatment in these wards. So that's what we targeted from start. And uh, it took eight hours of ID specialist time a week. I don't know if you, I think that was pretty efficient still. Uh, but, um, I mean, it's, it, it's eight hours a time per week in this program, and we're actually going to expand it now. Uh, but sure, it takes time. It does. But I think it's needed. Another question. Hi, Melanie Patiraju, Microbiology Consultant from Reading Hospital in the UK. Um, in, in the UK, we have a national strategy. It's uh, start smart and stay focused. The start smart is sort of getting the right antibiotic at the right time. The problem I have with my stewardship program, which I do daily on an acute medical ward, is the stay focused, is step down therapy. And the biggest issue is that our microbiology diagnostics are slow and insensitive. And I've been trying to sort of find new ways of introducing rapid diagnostics so we can get the etiologies that sensitive much quicker. Have you had the problem and have you, how have you overcome that? That's, that's a great that's question a great about, question. Yeah. Yeah, about yeah. sensitivities because I think that's you know, profound. So, gentlemen. Yeah, I mean, uh, go ahead. The timing of diagnosis is, is very important in stewardship programs. If you can get a quick diagnose, I mean, you get an, a better chance of, of, of actually focusing, as you said. Uh, so, it's crucial. Uh, we should define what quick means. What do, you, <laughs> what do you think quick should mean? 24 hours? infections that, uh, viral infections that mimic bacterial infections. So if you know in 24 hours would be idea that you're dealing with a virus, then I would like to sort of be able to stop um, in 24 hours actually. So, so yeah. 
I, I think what you said is the, the trick between discriminating between viruses and bacterial infections. So, so gentlemen. you know, there, there, there's some certainly new diagnostics coming around and that would be amazingly useful to have at our facility. Unfortunately, we don't. We're still stuck in, in, in the old, uh, in some of the older systems which require time to, you know, grow the microorganism, see what's going on. There's a lot of guesswork that goes on in the beginning. Uh, best guess to figure out what's going on with a patient and then you figure out over the next 72 hours. So that's one of the reasons why we have a 72 hour stop on our antibiotics. Because uh, every antibiotic must be reviewed by an infectious disease person uh, on the stewardship committee for 72 hours among the restricted lists to make sure that the use is appropriate and or that we have more data supporting the use of a less strong antibiotic at the time. What was your time window in, in your initial study in Sweden? Well, since we went, we went to the same wards twice a week, uh, some of the patients would have been in the ward for three days, some patients just arrived the day before. So that was the limit of our study. But uh, on the other hand, if you change diagnostics while you do a, a stewardship, you add a bias to the study if you, oh, want yeah. to, if you want to study it scientifically. So, I mean, we made a point of trying to not do any other intervention at the same time. Uh, but, I mean, ideally, it would be perfect but quicker yeah. diagnostics. Yeah. yeah, the statistician are, are, you know, statistics is a very jealous mistress. You yeah. know, you can't yeah. change anything. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Well, gentlemen, where do you think we need to go next? Is it getting faster diagnostics and integrating that into the stewardship program or measuring dollar saved so senior leadership appreciates the, the value that stewardship offers or looking at the resistome? So in our case, I think it's been fairly well established that stewardship programs save money. And that's nice, uh, but we want to show that it saves lives. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things we definitely need to make sure we do going forward. And, and again, making sure we know what's going on with the patient faster is always better. I mean, time is life, essentially, in, in, in patients who are sick with infections. Um, so getting, getting faster and better diagnostics that can tell us whether or not our antibiotics are the appropriate antibiotics will you know, shorten a 72-hour window to a 48 or a 24-hour window or even a few hours, depending on what diagnostics you're using. So that would ab absolutely be the, the, ne the best thing going forward. Well, we need to do all of those things, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Well, I think there was a, a review just a couple of years ago uh, where they did a survey in the, in the US where actually there was a shortage of ID specialists in these programs. Everybody wanted one, but they didn't have the funding to, to, to get one. To so we really forward. need resources as well to make this work. And I think the, the data are becoming more and more compelling that the resources in are far less than the value that's received from such programs. Absolutely. Um, well, there are many different programs and so, many yeah. different outcomes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh, I mean, but yes. On I, I think yes. one of the most exciting things out of your study was the readmissions. Yeah. within uh, 30 days of discharge. I think that is a, a very interesting metric to, to look at. We were actually surprised that we achieved a reduction in readmissions due to infections. In and our what was that rate? Well, it, we re reduced it from 7.5% to 4%. Wow, almost and, uh, half. Readmission due to infections, that was. Yeah. And it was significant. It was significant, yeah. That is phenomenal. We would news. love to be able to show something similar. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, in, in the United States, it's, it's one of the principal metrics that um, uh, the Center for Medicare Services is evaluating, our central uh, management unit for United States healthcare. They're, they're effectively taking a very close look at readmissions rates. So anything that we can do to impact that will have a phenomenal effect. Absolutely. Questions from the audience? Well, anything else? Oh, we should, why don't you tell us when your posters and presentations will actually be so we can actually have folks come and see them. So uh, my poster is today, I believe, at noon, um, if I'm not mistaken, during the poster presentation session. All right. Yeah. Same for me, today at noon. So everything is at noon today. Well, you've been listening to ASM Live, and I'd like to thank the audience for your participa participation in this edition of ASM Live. Please join us again 
Or listen for me, Michael Schmidt, when I join my colleagues Mozilio Schechter from Small Things Considered, Michelle Swanson from the University of Michigan, and our host Vince Racaniello from Columbia University for the next edition of This Week in Microbiology, the podcast that explores the unseen life on planet Earth. Goodbye, everybody, and thank you. Once you're in the BSL-4 space, the only way you can get out is to go through a chemical shock. It's an unusual room, never seen anything like this. Anybody who has access to this facility first has to go through an R scan. The HIPAA filters filter the air coming out of the facility and that will remove bacteria, viruses, anything that might constitute any kind of risk, right? Remember this building is, is basically a second building inside the main building.